Good evening, my friends. Grace and peace. Welcome to the table. A huge thank you um, to all the folks that came before me. We have Gary doing the, in the background doing tech, and then uh, of course Maggie and Mindy and uh, on music and Don. It's wonderful to have you um, doing our, our welcome. I uh, love it. And then uh, a shout out to Matthew for playing his amazing uh, piano at the beginning. So thank you uh, to everyone who's contributed to help make um, this service possible. And um, to all of you, uh, the listeners, our community, uh, watchers and listeners, um, we love you lots and are so grateful to have you with us tonight. So um, we are a community that's um, committed to being thoughtful, inclusive, eclectic, communal and vulnerable. Those are our values. And um, from living those out, we seek um, to shift a generation from reactionary to visionary through the person and work of Jesus. That's our mission. That's who we are. It's what we're about. And um, so if you are just joining us, maybe for the first time, that's a little bit of a taste of who we are. And uh, I hope that the whole service and this message really um, communicates that. Um, so before we before we jump in, though, I do want to um, just name that our, our church community is hoping um, to resume in person our meetups or our small groups um, this month. That's kind of our hope. Um, the numbers for Texas have been good, um, even for like Collin County. A lot of the counties have been quite good. Um, Dallas County, which is the one technically our church is in, not so good, but um, Still, we are kind of hoping for that. So I'm going to be sending out a communication on that this, this week um, to our church. So if you um, if you aren't on our email list and you'd like to be, um, kick us a message on our Facebook um, or our website, thetabletx.org, on the contact page, and just let us know. Now, that is different than my weekly e-letter. Um, so, you know, I don't send out church-specific emails to, like, you know, the whole list generally. Um, so that's specific if you kind of consider your self either part of the table or just someone who wants to stay in the loop and, and more of the details, um, then let us know and we'll get you on that. Um, so we are in the, let's see, it's the fourth and um, the final uh, part of our series titled uh, Lament, Giving Voice to Our Grief. And the title of my message uh, this week is A Pain Transformed. So our scripture today, it comes from Psalm uh, chapter 137, 137. And if you were uh, with us a few weeks ago, then you'll understand the context for this passage um, in a pretty deep, deep way. But I'll give you a little snippet for those who weren't here. So the story goes um, that historically, so the Jewish people, uh, just prior to the writing of this text, they have been conquered by the Babylonian Empire. Uh, thousands of them have been killed. Um, thousands have been exiled and scattered throughout um, really the, the entire Babylonian Empire. And it was an absolute national catastrophe. So that's the context for this psalm, uh, which is uh, written from the perspective of someone who, who no longer lives in their, their, um, their home, their hometown, Jerusalem. Um, so uh, they're now, they've been exiled, so now they're living somewhere in Babylon. Uh, so we pick up, up the text there in verse 1, Psalm 137, verse 1. By the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. And that's uh, Zion is another term for Jerusalem. Uh, there on the poplars, we hung our harps. For there our captors asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How, how can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? So I've been uh, kind of reflecting on, on our series and I've, I've been wondering, particularly because I'm not in person, you know, with you in the same way. I've been, I've been wondering how, how it has landed for you. I wonder um, if it's been you know, cathartic and, and helpful um, I wonder if it has been depressing. I wonder, uh, I wonder at times if people have maybe even like misunderstood um, lament or, or perhaps not even like misunderstand it, but simply have no really understanding at all of lament and what it's all about, at least in the biblical sense and the way we've been 
unpacking it. Um, because yes, lament is complaint. Yes, lament is is a groan. Um, lament is is saying this is not how the world should be. Uh, but the point of lament is not to to create rage and righteous indignation because it's too late for that. The righteous indignation is already there. It's already present in our minds, in our bodies. Uh, the point of lament is not to um, somehow, you know, encourage discouragement and depression to descend upon us like a cloud, because again, it's too late for that. For many of us, discouragement, depression, anxiety, angst, um, are already surrounding us. Mindy put that so beautifully earlier, right? It's it's too late, too late for that. And and this is what I think um, perhaps critics of lament miss, right? Because they're all like, well, you're, you're just going to bring everyone down. Uh, but what they don't realize is that it's too late. We're already down. Maybe not everyone, but many of us, right? We're already down. We already feel kicked to the curb, already have a creeping sense of despair, already feel disempowered, already watch the news and wonder, what can I do to change this? Already look at our lives uh, and wonder, how am I going to put this back together? Uh, in fact, this is why I think one of the reasons we listen to sad music, it's not because we want to be sad, but because there is a part of us, like so almost always already kind of grieving and hurting for the world. That's why we, we resonate um, with it. So in other words, there's no point in like playing pretend. We might as well face it straight on. We, we might as well learn, this is what Lament says, we might as well learn to speak honestly. And if we do this long enough and faithfully enough, if we become truth speakers and rather than silencing ourselves, instead we speak the truth to God and to others that we need to speak, what do we find happens? Our pain is transformed. Our pain is transformed by a loving God and a community, as we talked in our previous weeks, of faithful listeners. Our pain is transformed into life transforming action. That's the end game of lament. Lament does not end in complaint. It ends in faith. And there is a connection between Psalm 137 in the following chapter, Psalm uh, 138, yeah, lo and behold, 138 comes after, yeah. Uh, and I think it, it models this um, really perfectly. So as we just read, Psalm 137 is, um, it is someone deeply depressed. And um, in ways, it's almost kind of a uh, cliche, almost what they're, what they're doing. So uh, 137 verse 1 um, says, By the rivers of Babylon we sat and wept, when we remembered Zion, there on the poplars, we hung our harps. So uh, a poplar, this is a, a tree. And you can see the image here. Um, now, I guess there are kind of, I'd say, maybe two ways to interpret this. One is um, in, in a sense of an appropriate season of lament, right? Where it's not like if you think of a harp, it plays beautiful music, presumably happy music. And so that image of hanging your harp up on the tree could be kind of a season of lament where it's like, look, it's just not time to sing the praise songs, you know? So you hang up the harp. Um, but there, there is, I think, another way to read this, uh, which is maybe where you hang up your harp for good. Can you see the image there? Um, so, so the, this person, this psalmist, they're, they're hanging up, up their harp, they're hanging up their song, their joy, their hope, their worship, their faith, they're hanging it up. And, and I say it's that, like in that sense, it could be a little bit cliche because I'm thinking of like the 100 movies that are out there, you know, where the hero is like, that's it, that's it, I'm, I'm done, I'm done, right? Um, because, and it's sort of almost the, the image of like the sports athlete, 
you know, who maybe loses the championship game. And even though they're still in their prime, they say, I'm, I'm hanging up my cleats. Or the musician who says, songs? No, I don't write songs anymore. I'm done with songs. Songs have only let me down. Uh, and then they hang up their guitar. <laughs> or the poet who rips up their poems and declares they're through. The leader who resigns their position, I'm done. The spouse who prematurely files the divorce papers. Or the activist who throws away their signs. They're, they're hanging it up, right? And, and in ways, at times, we've all been there. And some of you are there right now. You're like, this darn world, <laughs> you're just, I'm done. And, and up go our harps onto the trees. Now, technically, uh, Psalm chapter 138 has no connection to Psalm 137. Two different Psalms, um, possibly two different writers, no connection. Uh, and yet, it is interesting that they were intentionally chosen to sit back to back. And I also don't think that that was a coincidence because read together, they, they exhibit this, this move that we see over and over and over again in the Psalms, which is the move from lament to praise. In fact, this is why uh, some people like psychologists have done like a psychological reading of the Psalms and they've accused the psalmists of being written by like a bipolar um, person. I'm like not joking because, right? Because if you've ever read the Psalms, you know, they're like all, you know, I'm enraged, God is nowhere. And then three verses later, Lord, you are faithful and true. <laughs> and, and that may sound a little bit like what is going on, but that's, I mean, I think actually that's really good like a really good description of what it's like to be human, right? Where I doubt God and I pray to him at the same time. I question God and yet trust that he will come through. Now this, this process, this is what the scholar Walter Brueggemann, who we've talked about a number of times in the series, he calls it the transition um, from disorientation to reorientation. That's the process in the Psalms and specifically the Psalms of Lament. Um, now, disorientation is what I just described, right? It's when when I hang up my harp on the tree. Um, disorientation is Psalm 137, verses 1 through 4. And, and so, um, but here's what's interesting. We go from Psalm 137, um, verse 4 says, How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? A and then... Um, to just a few verses later, Psalm 138, someone who apparently is still in a foreign land. Um, as you'll see in a moment, they talk about singing before other lowercase g gods. They talk about bowing down before like or toward the temple, not in the temple. Uh, so this is what it says, Psalm 138. I will praise you, Lord, with all of my heart. Before the gods, I will sing your praise. I will bow down toward your holy temple and will praise your name for your unfailing love and your faithfulness. For you have so exalted your solemn decree that it surpasses your fame. When I called, you answered me. You greatly emboldened me. And what I'm naming tonight is that this, this transition from lament to praise, from disorientation to reorientation, from fear to action is, is not only necessary, but, but what I'm naming is that lament actually helps to facilitate this process. That when we lament, we, we speak our pain to a loving God and a community of faithful listeners, and we find a transformation happening in our souls. And thank God for this, like for this process, because as Father Richard Rohr, he puts this really powerfully. He says, if we do not transform our pain, we will surely transmit it. Usually to those closest to us, our family, our neighbors, our co-workers, and invariably the most vulnerable, our children. You see, that's the question facing all of us. Will we transform our pain or will we transmit our pain? Will we do the work to move from lament into a place of praise and action or will we stop at complaint and moaning? I think of my friend, Stephen Alviso. Uh, some of you know him. For years, uh, he dealt 
And by the way, I got permission from all the people I'm about to talk about. Um, I got it from Stephen. Um, for years, so he dealt with the pain of an abusive father and the death of his brother. And he dealt with this by running to drugs and other addictive substances. But it wasn't until he faced into his pain, turned to God in repentance and then praise that his pain was transformed rather than transmitted. I think of our very own Don Jacobs, who you all got to see earlier, uh, wrestling with his identity as a gay man and the theology he was raised with that said God hated him. But what's happening? He is slowly learning to accept himself in the reality that God loves him. And he's now taking that pain and he's transforming it into leadership. As you mentioned, he's now leading a meetup that helps others encounter the grace and the love of God themselves. I think of our very own Karen Miner um, realizing that to be white in America is to exist with a certain level of, of inbuilt privilege. And she's now leading um, our Be the Bridge um, uh, course that, that is basically, um, it's a racial awareness study group. And um, what's so powerful is that in, in each of these instances, um, these folks, they're all moving from a place of disorientation to reorientation, from lament to praise, from fear to action. Now, uh, as we touched on last week though, this, this isn't only about the ways that, you know, like we as individuals might lament and then find, you know, our own personal individual healing. There is something deeper that happens uh, as well. And I think a hint of that depth is evident, um, not so much in, in, on the surface of the Psalms themselves, uh, as it is in the way the Psalms of Lament came to be used over time. You see, it's very possible that many of these Psalms were written by individuals wrestling with their own personal struggles. Uh, in other words, in, in many of the Psalms, there's like the psalmist, and then there's God. But, but what happened over time? Well, these psalms made their way into communities of faith, and suddenly they became communal events. You see, to lament as a Christian is not simply to lament as an isolated individual, but it is to lament in the context of a community. And what happens to the listeners as they engage my lament? That they are pushed, pushed to determine a faithful response. And when I think um, of what prompted us to start the table, it dawned on me that that's, that's a key part of what happened. We were in community with LGBTQ people, and suddenly their laments forced us to determine a faithful response. And last Sunday, we talked extensively about the murder of George Floyd. And I, I do not know exactly how that landed on all the ears of the white members of, of our community. But what did that time of lament do? It forced us to face the question, what does a faithful response look like? And it pushed some of you, some of you who have never posted politically on social media, you did that this week. And it pushed others to attend a protest or to call their congressman or woman and on and on and on. And so as, as we journey ahead, what I want you to consider, um, well, consider this sermon a call to not only lament, but a call to action in the weeks and the months ahead. I want us to start figuring out how we can help bring both love and justice to our city. Let's make a decision to be a people who transform our pain, 
rather than transmit it. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, um, our heart's cry is to be a church that can honestly lament, that can speak the truth, that can say the uncomfortable word, the honest word. And God, I pray um, that through that, that it would transform us. And I pray for over every person listening, God, who right now they're just in a place of deep um, sorrow, grief, struggle. Um, I pray that um, that as they they speak that truth out in a community of faithful listeners, that their pain would be transformed. And for all of those who um, are are in a place where they're they're ready to to move forward to work for justice, I pray that you would lead them, lead us um, to wise and faithful action. God, continue to um, do that work in our hearts. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. So in closing, um, in this season, I I want to... um, just kind of give, I guess, give us a few little calls to action as a church will be in the coming months, figuring out um, broader ways to do this. But um, but for now, if you're just looking for something to do tonight, um, I want to mention two opportunities for you. The first is um, to donate to Five Loaves Food Pantry. Um, this is an organization in Saxe. And um, in the light of everything with COVID-19 and the downturn in the economy, um, the, this I was talking with Audrey, who helps run this, and they are definitely running low on food. Um, she said they're basically just anything we could do um, to donate, whether financially or um, to give food, they would be greatly, um, just, just really appreciative. Um, so at any rate, you can donate there. You can also um, donate to the Dallas Truth um, Racial Healing and Transformation um, Nonprofit Organization. This is a, a community working um, at the intersection of um, racial injustice in, um, in, in Dallas. And so uh, we, this is basically, yeah, just two kind of opportunities and ways for you to um, get involved. You can also research those organizations and maybe like donate time and energy. I know they would um, greatly appreciate it. So um, we're going to go ahead and uh, transition uh, over to some more music. So I love you all. Have a wonderful, wonderful week. <laughs>